Section 53 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 40, Part 2. A charge of three sen per ri more for the horses for the next stage, because there were such bad mountains to cross, prepared me for what followed many miles of the worst road for horses i ever saw i should not have complained if they had charged double the price as an almost certain consequence it was one of the most picturesque routes i have ever travelled for some distance however it runs placidly along by the seashore on which big blue foam-crested rollers were disporting themselves noisily and passes through several Aino hamlets, and the Aino village of Abuta, with sixty houses, rather a prosperous-looking place, where the cultivation was considerably more careful, and the people possessed a number of horses. Several of the houses were surrounded by bears' skulls, grinning from between the forked tops of high poles, and there was a well-grown bear ready for his doom and apotheosis. In nearly all the houses a woman was weaving bark cloth, with the hook which holds the web fixed into the ground several feet outside the house. At a deep river called the Nopokobetsu, which emerges from the mountains close to the sea, we were ferried by an Aino completely covered with hair, which on his shoulders was wavy like that of a retriever, and rendered clothing quite needless neither for covering or warmth. A wavy black beard rippled nearly to his waist over his furry chest, and, with his black locks hanging in masses over his shoulders, he would have looked a thorough savage had it not been for the exceeding sweetness of his smile and eyes. The Volcano Bay Ainos are far more hairy than the Mountain Ainos, but even among them it is quite common to see men not more so than vigorous Europeans, and I think that the hairiness of the race as a distinctive feature has been much exaggerated, partly by the smooth-skinned Japanese. The fairy scow was nearly upset by our four horses beginning to fight. At first one bit the shoulders of another, then the one attacked uttered sharp, sharp squeals, and returned the attack by striking with his forefeet, and then there was a general melee of striking and biting till some ugly wounds were inflicted i have watched fights of this kind on a large scale every day in the coral the miseries of the yezo horses are the great drawback of yezo travelling they are brutally used and are covered with awful wounds from being driven at a fast scramble with the rude ungirthed pack saddle and its heavy load rolling about on their backs and they are beaten unmercifully over their eyes and ears with heavy sticks. Ito has been barbarous to these gentle, little-prized animals ever since we came to Yezo. He has vexed me more by this than by anything else, especially as he never dared even to carry a switch on the main island, either from fear of the horses or their owners. Today he was beating the baggage horse unmercifully, when I rode back and interfered with some very strong language, saying, You are a bully, and, like all bullies, a coward. Imagine my aggravation when, at our first halt, he brought out his notebook, as usual, and quietly asked me the meaning of the words bully and coward. It was perfectly impossible to explain them, so I said a bully was the worst name I could call him, and that a coward was the meanest thing a man could be. Then the provoked boy said, Is bully a worse name than devil? Yes, far worse, I said, on which he seemed rather crestfallen, and he has not beaten his horse since, in my sight at least. The breaking in process is simply breaking the spirit by an hour or two of such atrocious cruelty as I saw at Shiraoi, at the end of which the horse, covered with foam and blood, and bleeding from mouth and nose, falls down exhausted. Being so ill-used, they have all kinds of tricks, such as lying down in fords, throwing themselves down head foremost and rolling over pack and rider, bucking and resisting attempts to make them go otherwise than in single file. 
instead of bits they have bars of wood on each side of the mouth secured by a rope through the nose and chin when horses which have been broken with bits gallop they put up their heads till the nose is level with the ears and it is useless to try either to guide or check them they are always wanting to join the great herds on the hillside or seashore from which they are only driven down as they are needed in every yezo village the first sound that one hears at break of day is the gallop of forty or fifty horses pursued by an aino who has hunted them from the hills a horse is worth from twenty-eight shillings upwards they are very sure-footed when their feet are not sore and cross a stream or chasm on a single rickety plank or walk on a narrow ledge above a river or gulch without fear they are barefooted their hoofs are very hard and i am glad to be rid of the perpetual tying and untying and replacing of the straw shoes of the well-cared-for horses of the main island a man rides with them and for a man and three horses the charge is only sixpence for each two and a half miles i am now making ito ride in front of me to make sure that he does not beat or otherwise misuse his beast after crossing the nopkobetsu from which the fighting horses have led me to make so long a digression we went right up into the bad mountains and crossed the three tremendous passes of lebungetoge except by saying that this disused bridle track is impassable people have scarcely exaggerated its difficulties one horse broke down on the first pass and we were long delayed by sending the aino back for another possibly these extraordinary passes do not exceed one thousand five hundred feet in height but the track ascends them through a dense forest with most extraordinary abruptness to descend as abruptly to rise again sometimes by a series of nearly washed away zigzags at others by a straight ladder-like ascent deeply channelled the bottom of the trough being filled with rough stones large and small or with ledges of rock with an entangled mass of branches and trailers overhead which render it necessary to stoop over the horse's head while he is either fumbling stumbling or tumbling among the stones in a gash a foot wide or else is awkwardly leaping up broken rock steps nearly the height of his chest the whole performance consisting of a series of scrambling jerks at the rate of a mile an hour in one of the worst places the aino's horse which was just in front of mine in trying to scramble up a nearly breast-high and much worn ledge fell backwards nearly overturning my horse the stretcher poles which formed part of his pack striking me so hard above my ankle that for some minutes afterwards i thought the bone was broken the ankle was severely cut and bruised and bled a good deal and i was knocked out of the saddle ito's horse fell three times and eventually the four were roped together such are some of the divertisements of yezo travel ah but it was glorious the views are most magnificent this is really paradise everything is here huge headlands magnificently timbered small deep bays into which the great green waves roll majestically great grey cliffs too perpendicular for even the most adventurous trailer to find root hold bold bluffs and outlying stacks set are crested glimpses of bright blue ocean dimpling in the sunshine or tossing up wreaths of foam among ferns and trailers and inland ranges of mountains forest covered with tremendous gorges between forest filled where wolf bear and deer make their nearly inaccessible lairs and outlying battlements and ridges of grey rock with hardly six feet of level on their sinuous tops and cedars in masses giving deep shadow and sprays of scarlet maple or festoons of a crimson wine lightening the gloom the inland view suggested infinity there seemed no limit to the forest-covered mountains and the unlighted ravines the wealth of vegetation was equal in luxuriance and entanglement to that of the tropics primeval vegetation on which the lumberous axe has never rung trees of immense height and girth especially the beautiful salisburia adiantifolia with its small fan-shaped leaves 
all matted together by riotous lianas rise out of an impenetrable undergrowth of the dwarf dark-leaved bamboo which dwarf as it is attains a height of seven feet and all is dark solemn soundless the haunt of wild beasts and of butterflies and dragonflies of the most brilliant colours there was light without heat leaves and streams sparkled and there was nothing of the half-smothered sensation which is often produced by the choking greenery of the main island for frequently far below the pacific flashed in all its sunlit beauty and occasionally we came down unexpectedly on a little cove with abrupt cedar crested headlands and stacks and a heavy surf rolling in with the deep thunder music which alone breaks the stillness of this silent land there was one tremendous declivity where i got off to walk but found it too steep to descend on foot with comfort you can imagine how steep it was when i tell you that the deep groove being too narrow for me to get to the side of my horse i dropped down upon him from behind between his tail and the saddle and so scrambled on the sun had set and the dew was falling heavily when the track dipped over the brow of a headland becoming a waterway so steep and rough that i could not get down it on foot without the assistance of my hands and terminating on a lonely little bay of great beauty walled in by impracticable-looking headlands which was the entrance to an equally impracticable-looking densely wooded valley running up among densely wooded mountains there was a margin of grey sand above the sea and on this the skeleton of an enormous whale was bleaching two or three large dugouts with planks laced with stout fibre on their gunwales and some bleached driftwood lay on the beach the foreground of a solitary rambling dilapidated grey house bleached like all else where three japanese men with an old aino servant live to look after government interests whatever these may be and keep rooms and horses for government officials a great boon to travellers who like me are belated here only one person has passed le bungay this year except two officials and a policeman there was still a red glow on the water and one horn of a young moon appeared above the wooded headland but the loneliness and isolation are overpowering and it is enough to produce madness to be shut in for ever with the thunder of the everlasting surf which compels one to raise one's voice in order to be heard in the wood half a mile from the sea there is an aino village of thirty houses and the appearance of a few of the savages gliding noiselessly over the beach in the twilight added to the ghastliness and loneliness of the scene the horses were unloaded by the time i arrived and several courteous ainos showed me to my room opening on a small courtyard with a heavy gate the room was musty and being rarely used swarmed with spiders a saucer of fish oil and a wick rendered darkness visible and showed faintly the dark pathetic faces of a row of ainos in the veranda who retired noiselessly with their graceful salutation when i bade them good night food was hardly to be expected yet they gave me rice potatoes and black beans boiled in equal parts of brine and syrup which are very palatable the cuts and bruises of yesterday became so very painful with the cold of the early morning that i have been obliged to remain here i l b end of section fifty three fifty four of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 41. Hakodate, September 12. Le Bunge is a much fascinating place in its awful isolation. The housemaster was a friendly man and much attached to the Ainos. If other officials entrusted with Aino concerns treat the Ainos as fraternally as those of Uzu and Le Bunge, there is not much to lament. This man also gave them a high character for honesty and harmlessness, 
and asked if they might come and see me before i left so twenty men mostly carrying very pretty children came into the yard with the horses they had never seen a foreigner but either from apathy or politeness they neither stare nor press upon one as the japanese do and always make a courteous recognition the bearskin housing of my saddle pleased them very much and my boots of unblacked leather which they compared to the deer hide moccasins which they were for winter hunting their voices were the lowest and most musical that i have heard incongruous sounds to proceed from such hairy powerful looking men their love for their children was most marked they caressed them tenderly and held them aloft for notice and when the housemaster told them how much i admired the brown dark-eyed winsome creatures their faces lighted with pleasure and they saluted me over and over again these like other ainos utter a short screeching sound when they are not pleased and then one recognizes the savage these lebunge ainos differ considerably from those of the eastern villages and i have again to notice the decided sound or click of the ts at the beginning of many words their skins are as swarthy as those of bedouin their foreheads comparatively low their eyes far more deeply set their stature lower their hair yet more abundant the look of wistful melancholy more marked and two who were unclothed for hard work in fashioning a canoe were almost entirely covered with short black hair specially thick on the shoulders and back and so completely concealing the skin as to reconcile one to the lack of clothing i noticed an enormous breadth of chest and a great development of the muscles of the arms and legs all these ainos shave their hair off for two inches above their brows only allowing it there to attain the length of an inch among the well-clothed ainos in the yard there was one smooth face smooth-skinned concave-chested spindle-limbed yellow japanese with no other clothing than the decorated bark cloth apron which the ainos wear in addition to their coats and leggings escorted by these gentle friendly savages i visited their lodges which are very small and poor and in every way inferior to those of the mountain ainos their women are short and thick-set and most uncomely from their village i started for the longest and by reputation the worst stage of my journey seventeen miles the first ten of which are over mountains so solitary and disused is this track that on a four days journey we have not met a human being in the lebunge valley which is densely forested and abounds with fordable streams and treacherous ground i came upon a grand specimen of the salisburia adiantifolia which at a height of three feet from the ground divides into eight lofty stems none of them less than two feet five inches in diameter this tree which grows rapidly is so well adapted to our climate that i wonder it has not been introduced on a large scale as it may be seen by everybody in kew gardens there is another tree with orbicular leaves in pairs which grows to an immense size from this valley a worn-out stony bridle track ascends the western side of lebunge toge climbing through a dense forest of trees and trailers to a height of about two thousand feet where contended with its efforts it reposes and with only slight up and downs continues along the top of a narrow ridge within the seaward mountains between high walls of dense bamboo which for much of that day's journey is the undergrowth alike of mountain and valley ragged peak and rugged ravine the scenery was as magnificent as on the previous day a guide was absolutely needed as the track ceased altogether in one place and for some time the horses had to blunder their way along a bright rushing river swirling rapidly downwards heavily bordered with bamboo full of deep holes and made difficult by trees which have fallen across it there ito whose horse could not keep up with the others was lost or rather lost himself which led to a delay of two hours i have never seen grander forest than on that two days ride 
at last the track barely passable after its recovery dips over a precipitous bluff and descends close to the sea which has evidently receded considerably thence it runs for six miles on a level sandy strip covered near the sea with a dwarf bamboo about five inches high and farther inland with red roses and blue campanula at the foot of the bluff there is a ruinous japanese house where an aino family has been placed to give shelter and rest to any who may be crossing the pass i opened my bento bako of red lacquer and found that it contained some cold waxy potatoes on which i dined with the addition of some tea and then waited wearily for ito for whom the guide went in search the house and its inmates were a study the ceiling was gone and all kinds of things for which i could not imagine any possible use hung from the blackened rafters everything was broken and decayed and the dirt was appalling a very ugly aino woman hardly human in her ugliness was splitting bark fibre there were several irori japanese fashion and at one of them a grand-looking old man was seated apathetically contemplating the boiling of a pot old and sitting among ruins he represented the fate of a race which living has no history and perishing leaves no monument by the other irori sat or rather crouched the missing link i was startled when i first saw it it was shall i say a man and the mate i cannot write the husband of the ugly woman it was about fifty the lofty aino brow had been made still loftier by shaving the head for three inches above it the hair hung not in shocks but in snaky wisps mingling with a beard which was grey and matted the eyes were dark but vacant and the face had no other expression than that look of apathetic melancholy which one sometimes sees on the faces of captive beasts the arms and legs were unnaturally long and thin and the creature sat with the knees tucked into the armpits the limbs and body with the exception of a patch on each side were thinly covered with fine black hair more than an inch long which was slightly curly on the shoulders it showed no other sign of intelligence than that evidenced by boiling water for my tea when ito arrived he looked at it with disgust exclaiming the ainos are just dogs they had a dog for their father in allusion to their own legend of their origin the level was pleasant after the mountains and a canter took us pleasantly to oshamambe where we struck the old road from mori to satsuporo and where i halted for a day to rest my spine from which i was suffering much oshamambe looks dismal even in the sunshine decayed and dissipated with many people lounging about it doing nothing with the dazed look which overindulgence in sake gives to the eyes the sun was scorching hot and i was glad to find refuge from it in a crowded and dilapidated yadoya where there were no black beans and the use of eggs did not appear to be recognized my room was only enclosed by shoji and there were scarcely five minutes of the day in which eyes were not applied to the finger-holes with which they were liberally riddled and during the night one of them fell down revealing six japanese sleeping in a row each head on a wooden pillow the grandeur of the route ceased with the mountain passes but in the brilliant sunshine the ride from oshamambe to mori which took me two days was as pretty and pleasant as it could be at first we got on very slowly as besides my four horses there were four led ones going home which got up fights and entangled their ropes and occasionally lay down and rolled and besides these there were three foals following their mothers and if they stayed behind the mares hung back neighing and if they frolicked ahead the mares wanted to look after them and the whole string showed a combined inclination to dispense with their riders and join the many herds of horses which we passed it was so tedious that after enduring it for some time i got ito's horse and mine into a scow at a river of some size and left the disorderly drove to follow at leisure 
At Yurappu, where there is an Aino village of thirty houses, we saw the last of the Aborigines, and the interest of the journey ended. Strips of hard sand below a high water mark, strips of red roses, ranges of wooded mountains, rivers deep and shallow, a few villages of old grey houses amidst grey sand and bleaching driftwood, and then came the river Yurappu, a broad deep stream, navigable in a canoe for fourteen miles. The scenery there was truly beautiful in the late and splendid afternoon. The long blue waves rolled on shore, each one crested with light as it curled before it broke, and hurled its snowy drift for miles along the coast with a deep booming music. The glorious inland view was composed of six ranges of forest-covered mountains, broken, chasmed, caverned, and dark with timber, and above them bald grey peaks rose against the green sky of singular purity. I longed to take a boat up the Yurappu, which penetrates by many a gorge into their solemn recesses, but had no strength to carry my wish. After this I exchanged a silence, or a low musical speech of Aino guides, for the harsh and ceaseless clatter of Japanese. At Yamakushinoi, a small hamlet on the seashore where I slept, there was a sweet, quiet yadoya, delightfully situated, with a wooded cliff at the back, over which a crescent hung out of pure sky, and besides there were the more solid pleasures of fish, eggs, and black beans. Thus, instead of being starved and finding wretched accommodation, the week I spent on Volcano Bay has been the best fed, as it was certainly the most comfortable week of my travels in northern Japan. Another glorious day favoured my ride to Mori, but I was unfortunate in my horse at each stage, and the Japanese guide was grumpy and ill-natured, a most unusual thing. Otoshibe and a few other small villages of grey houses with an ancient and fish-like smell lie along the coast, busy enough doubtless in the season, but now looking deserted and decayed, and houses are rather plentifully sprinkled among many parts of the shore, with a wonderful profusion of vegetables and flowers about them, raised from seeds liberally supplied by the Kaitakushi department from its Nanai experimental farm and nurseries. For a considerable part of the way to Mori there is no track at all, though there is a good deal of travel. One makes one's way fatiguingly along soft sea sand or coarse shingle close to the sea, or absolutely in it, under cliffs of hardened clay or yellow conglomerate, fording many small streams, several of which have cut their way deeply through a stratum of black volcanic sand. I have crossed about one hundred rivers and streams on the Yezo coast, and all the larger ones are marked by a most noticeable peculiarity, that is, that on nearing the sea they turn south, and run for some distance parallel with it, before they succeed in finding an exit through the bank of sand and shingle which forms the beach and blocks their progress. On the way I saw two Ainos land through the surf in a canoe, in which they had paddled for nearly one hundred miles. A river canoe is dug out of a single log, and two men can fashion one in five days, but on examining this one, which was twenty-five feet long, I found that it consisted of two halves, laced together with very strong bark fibre for their whole length, and with high sides also laced on. They consider that they are stronger for rough sea and surf work when made in two parts. Their bark fibre rope is beautifully made, and they twist it of all sizes, from twine up to a nine-inch holster. Beautiful as the blue ocean was, I had too much of it, for the horses were either walking in a leather of sea foam or were crowded between the cliff and the sea every larger wave breaking over my foot and irreverently splashing my face, and the surges were so loud-tongued and incessant, throwing themselves on the beach with a tremendous boom, and drawing the shingle back with them with an equally tremendous rattle, so impolite and noisy, bent only on showing their strength, reckless, rude, self-willed, and inconsiderate. 
this purposeless display of force and this incessant waste of power and the noisy self-assertion in both approach vulgarity towards evening we crossed the last of the bridgeless rivers and put up at mori which i left three weeks before and i was very thankful to have accomplished my object without disappointment disaster or any considerable discomfort had i not promised to return ito to his master by a given day i should like to spend the next six weeks in the yezo wilds for the climate is good the scenery beautiful and the objects of interest are many another splendid day favoured my ride from mori to togenoshita where i remained for the night and i had exceptionally good horses for both days though the one which ito rode while going at a rapid scramble threw himself down three times and rolled over to rid himself from flies i had not admired the wood between mori and ginsainoma the lakes on the sullen grey day on which i saw it before but this time there was an abundance of light and shadow and solar glitter and many a scarlet spray and crimson trailer and many a maple flaming in the valleys gladdened me with the music of colour from the top of the pass beyond the lakes there is a grand view of the volcano in all its nakedness with its lava beds and fields of pumice with the lakes of onuma konuma and ginsainuma lying in the forests at its feet and from the top of another hill there is a remarkable view of windy hakodate with its headland looking like gibraltar the slopes of this hill are covered with the aconitum japonicum of which the ainos make their arrow poison the yadoya at togenushita was a very pleasant and friendly one and when ito woke me yesterday morning saying are you sorry that it's the last morning i am i felt we had one subject in common for i was very sorry to end my pleasant yezo tour and very sorry to part with the boy who had made himself more useful and invaluable even than before it was most wearisome to have hakodate in sight for twelve miles so near across the bay so far across the long flat stony strip which connects the headland upon which it is built with the mainland for about three miles the road is rudely macadamized and as soon as the barefooted horses get upon it they seem lame of all their legs they hang back stumbling dragging edging to the side and trying to run down every opening so that when we got into the interminable main street i sent ito to the consulate for my letters and dismounted hoping that as it was raining i should not see any foreigners but i was not so lucky for first i met mr denning and then seeing the consul and dr hepburn coming down the road evidently dressed for dining in the flagship and looking spruce and clean i dodged up an alley to avoid them but they saw me and did not wonder that i wished to escape notice for my old Beto's hat, my torn green paper waterproof, and my riding skirt and boots were not only splashed but caked with mud, and I had the general look of a person fresh from the wilds. I. L. B. Itinerary of tour in Yezo. Hakodate to Ginzainoma. Four Japanese houses. Seven ri. 18 cho hakodate to mori 105 japanese houses 40 hakodate to morodan 57 japanese houses 11 ri hakodate to horobetsu 18 japanese 47 aino houses 5 ri 1 cho hakodate to shiraoi Eleven Japanese, fifty one Aino houses, six ri, thirty two cho. Hakodate to Tomakomai, thirty eight Japanese houses, five ri, twenty one cho. Hakodate to Yubetsu, seven Japanese, three Aino houses, three ri, five cho. Hakodate to Sarufuto, sixty three Japanese houses. Seven ri, five cho. 
Hakodate to Biratori. Fifty three Aino houses. Five ri. Hakodate to Mombetsu. Twenty seven Japanese houses. Five ri. One cho. From Horobetsu to Old Murodan. Nine Japanese. Thirty Aino houses. Four ri. Twenty eight cho. From Horobetsu to Uzu. Three Japanese, ninety-nine Aino houses. Six ri, two cho. From Horobetsu to Lebunge, one Japanese, twenty-seven Aino houses. Five ri, twenty-two cho. From Horobetsu to Oshamambe, fifty-six Japanese, thirty-eight Aino houses. Six ri, thirty-four cho. From Horobetsu to Yamakushinai, Forty Japanese houses. Fori, eighteen cho. From Horobetsu to Otoshibe, forty Japanese houses. Two ri, three cho. From Horobetsu to Mori, one hundred and five Japanese houses. Three ri, twenty nine cho. From Horobetsu to Togenoshita, fifty five Japanese houses. Six ri, seven cho. From Horobetsu to Hakodate, thirty-seven thousand souls, three ri, twenty-nine cho. About three hundred fifty-eight English miles. End of section fifty-four. Fifty-five of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 42. Hakodate, Yezo, September 14, 1878. This is my last day in Yezo, and the sun, shining brightly over the grey and windy capital, is touching the pink peaks of Komunotaki with a deeper red, and is brightening my last impressions, which, like my first, are very pleasant. The bay is deep blue, flecked with violet shadows, and about sixty junks are floating upon it at anchor. There are vessels of foreign rig, too, but the one, pale junks, lying motionless, or rolling into the harbour under their great white sails, fascinate me as when I first saw them in the Gulf of Yedo. They are antique-looking and picturesque, but are fitter to give interest to a picture than to battle with stormy seas. Most of the junks in the bay are about 120 tons burthen, 100 feet long, with an extreme beam far aft of 25 feet. The bow is long and curves into a lofty stem, like that of a Roman galley, finished with a beak head to secure the forestay of the mast. This beak is furnished with two large goggle eyes. The mast is a ponderous spar, fifty feet high, composed of pieces of pine, pegged, glued, and hooped together. A heavy yard is hung amidships. The sail is an oblong of widths of strong white cotton, artistically puckered, not sewn together, but laced vertically, leaving a decorative lacing six inches wide between each two widths. Instead of reefing in a strong wind, a width is unlaced so as to reduce the canvas vertically, not horizontally. Two blue spheres commonly adorn the sail. The mast is placed well abaft, and to tack or veer it is only necessary to reverse the sheet. When on a wind, the long bow and nose serve as a headsail. The high, square-piled-up stern, with its antique carving and the sides with their letter-work, are wonderful, together with the extraordinary size and projection of the rudder and the length of the tiller. The anchors are of grapnel shape, and the larger junks have from six to eight arranged on the fore-end, giving one an idea of bad holding ground along the coast. They really are much like the shape of a Chinese small-footed woman's shoe and look very unmanageable. They are of unpainted wood and have a wintry, ghastly look about them. I have parted with Ito finally today, with great regret. 
he has served me faithfully and on most common topics i can get much more information through him than from any foreigner i miss him already though he insisted on packing for me as usual and put all my things in order his cleverness is something surprising he goes to a good manly master who will help him to be good and set him a virtuous example and that is a satisfaction before he left he wrote a letter for me to the governor of Mororan, thanking him on my behalf for the use of the kuruma and other courtesies. I. L. B. End of section 55six of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 43. HBM's Legation, Yedo, September 21st. A placid sea, which after much disturbance had sighed itself to rest, and a high, steady barometer promised a fifty hours' passage to Yokohama, and when Dr. and Mrs. Hepburn and I left Hakodate, by moonlight on the night of the 14th, as the only passengers in the Hyogo Maru, Captain Moore, her general, pleasant master, congratulated us on the rapid and delightful passage before us, and we separated at midnight with many projects for pleasant intercourse and occupation. But a more miserable voyage I never made, and it was not until the afternoon of the 17th that we crawled forth from our cabins to speak to each other. On the second day out, great heat came on with suffocating closeness, the mercury rose to 85 degrees, and in latitude 38 degrees 0 minutes north, and longitude 141 degrees 30 minutes east, we encountered a typhoon, otherwise a cyclone, otherwise a revolving hurricane, which lasted for 25 hours and jettisoned the cargo. Captain Moore has given me a very interesting diagram of it, showing the attempts which he made to avoid its vortex, through which our course would have taken us, and to keep as much outside it as possible. The typhoon was succeeded by a dense fog, so that our fifty-hour passage became seventy-two hours, and we landed at Yokohama near upon midnight on the 17th, to find traces of much disaster, the whole low-lying country flooded, the railway between Yokohama and the capital impassable, great anxiety about the rice crop, the air full of alarmist rumours, and paper money, which was about par when I arrived in May, at a discount of 13 per cent. In the early part of this year, 1880, it has touched 42 per cent. Late in the afternoon the railroad was reopened, and I came here with Mr. Wilkinson, glad to settle down to a period of rest and ease under this hospitable roof. The afternoon was bright and sunny, and Tokyo was looking its best. The long lines of yashikis looked handsome. The castle moat was so full of the gigantic leaves of the lotus that the water was hardly visible. The grass embankments of the upper moat were a brilliant green. The pines on their summits stood out boldly against a clear sky, the hill on which the legation stands looked dry and cheerful, and, better than all, I had a most kindly welcome from those who have made this house my home in a strange land. Tokyo is tranquil, that is, it is disturbed only by fears for the rice crop and by the fall in Satsu. The military mutineers have been tried, popular rumour says tortured, and fifty-two have been shot. The summer has been the worst for some years, and now dark heat, moist heat, and nearly ceaseless rain prevail. People have been rained up in their summer quarters. Surely it will change soon, people say, and they have said the same thing for three months. I. L. B. End of section 56 Seven of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. 
Letter 44. HBM's Legation, Yedo, December 18. I have spent the last ten days here, in settled fine weather, such as should have begun two months ago, if the climate had behaved as it ought. The time has flown by in excursions, shopping, select little dinner parties, farewell calls, and visits made with Mr. Chamberlain to the famous groves and temples of Ikegami, where the Buddhist bishop and priests entertained us in one of the guest-rooms, and to Enoshima and Kamakura, vulgar resorts which nothing can vulgarize so long as Fujisan towers above them. I will mention but one site, which is so far out of the beaten track, that it was only after prolonged inquiry that its whereabouts were ascertained. Among Buddhists, especially of the Monto sect, cremation was largely practised till it was forbidden five years ago, as some suppose, in deference to European prejudices. Three years ago, however, the prohibition was withdrawn, and in this short space of time the number of bodies burned has reached already 9,000 annually. Sir H. Parks applied for permission for me to visit the Kirigaya ground, one of five, and after a few delays it was granted by the governor of Tokyo at Mr. Mori's request, so, yesterday, attended by the legation linguist, I presented myself at the fine yashiki of the Tokyo Fu, and, quite unexpectedly, was admitted to an audience of the governor. Mr. Kusamoto is a well-bred gentleman, and his face expresses the energy and ability which he has given proof of possessing. He wears his European clothes becomingly, and in attitude, as well as manner, is easy and dignified. After asking me a great deal about my northern tour and the Ainos, he expressed a wish for candid criticism, but as this in the east must not be taken literally, I merely ventured to say that the roads lag behind the progress made in other directions, upon which he entered upon explanations which doubtless apply to the past road history of the country. He spoke of cremation and its necessity in large cities, and terminated the interview by requesting me to dismiss my interpreter and Kuruma, as he was going to send me to Meguro in his own carriage, with one of the government interpreters, adding very courteously that it gave him pleasure to show his attention to a guest of the British minister, for whose character and important services to Japan he has a high value. An hour's drive, with an extra amount of yelling from the bettos, took us to a suburb of little hills and valleys, where red camellias and feathery bamboo against backgrounds of cryptomeria contrast with the grey monotone of British winters, and, alighting at a farm road too rough for a carriage, we passed through fields and hedgerows to an erection which looks too insignificant for such solemn news. Don't expect any ghastly details. A longish building of wattle and dab, much like the northern farmhouses, a high roof, and chimneys resembling those of the oast houses in Kent, combine with the rural surroundings to suggest farm buildings rather than the funeral pyre, and all that is horrible is left to the imagination. The end nearest the road is a little temple, much crowded with images, and small, red, earthenware urns and tongs for sale to the relatives of deceased persons, and beyond this are four rooms with earthen floors and mud walls, nothing noticeable about them except the height of the peaked roof and the dark colour of the plaster. In the middle of the largest are several pairs of granite supports at equal distances from each other, and in the smallest there is a solitary pair. This was literally all that was to be seen. In the large room several bodies are burnt at one time, and the charge is only one yen, about three shillings eight pounds, solitary cremation costing five yen. Faggots are used, and one shilling worth ordinarily suffices to reduce a human form to ashes. After the funeral service in the house, the body is brought to the cremation ground, and is left in charge of the attendant, a melancholy, smoked-looking man, as well he may be. The richer people sometimes pay priests to be present during the burning, but this is not usual. 
there were five quick tubs of pine hooped with bamboo in the larger room containing the remains of coolies and a few oblong pine chests in the small rooms containing those of middle-class people at eight p m each coffin is placed on the stone trestles the faggots are lighted underneath the fires are replenished during the night and by six a m that which was a human being is a small heap of ashes which is placed in an urn by the relatives and is honourably interred in some cases the priests accompany the relations on this last mournful errand thirteen bodies were burnt the night before my visit but there was not the slightest odour in or about the building and the interpreter told me that owing to the height of the chimneys the people of the neighbourhood never experience the least annoyance even while the process is going on the simplicity of the arrangement is very remarkable and there can be no reasonable doubt that it serves the purpose of the innocuous and complete destruction of the corpse as well as any complicated apparatus if not better while its cheapness places it within the reach of the class which is most heavily burdened by ordinary funeral expenses this morning the governor sent his secretary to present me with a translation of an interesting account of the practice of cremation and its introduction into japan s s volga christmas eve eighteen seventy eight the snowy dome of fujisan reddening in the sunrise rose above the violet woodlands of mississippi bay as we steamed out of yokohama on the nineteenth and three days later i saw the last of japan a rugged coast lashed by a wintry sea i l b end of section fifty seven end of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird thanks for listening